I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. Sarah being a bit flaky, could you repeat that? It's a fun time to be developing fluency in this space. I think I was very early to a lot of discourse around bias and particularly talking about how we would legitimately expect like bias to appear in these systems as they start to be deployed before that they were actually deployed. And so now they're actually being deployed and you're just like sitting there watching it like, uh huh. That thing I said in a video like four years ago, um, yeah, <laughs> that that is now what is happening. This is fun and no one listened and that's great. <laughs> Artificial intelligence has been having a recurring issue for a while now. Sometimes it can be kind of racist. Let's look at some examples of this. One of the biggest examples of discrimination using AI was recidivism prediction, or how likely someone is to recommit a crime. ProPublica published an article entitled Machine Bias about three years ago that highlighted a software that people were using to determine how likely a defendant was to recommit a crime when going to trial. The catch was that the software was a lot more likely to assign black people a much higher risk than any other demographic group, and white people in general were assigned lower risks than any other demographic group. It is meant to improve our lives, but some of the things that power our lives each day can contain hidden biases. As NBC2's Ashley Graham reveals, that can result in unfair practices toward communities of color. Done. But sometimes it can do more harm than good. For decades, people of color were kept out of home ownership, a practice called redlining. Though this practice is now illegal, the results have not changed. The information used in redlining has largely been fed into new algorithms that are essentially doing the same kind of thing without the racist overtones. But is technology failing in home lending, medicine, and facial recognition and security? The answer is yes. If tech is fed bad information, it will continue to give us bad outputs. Unfortunately, there are some biases uh, that can pop up in that area. Let's not make a show in front of your wife and kids because you are under arrest. This is Robert Williams. Three years ago, he was arrested on his driveway for a crime he hadn't committed. They made a mistake, baby. It's okay. The reason? Artificial intelligence mistook him for this man, who was suspected to have stolen thousands of dollars worth of watches. My name is Jordan Harrod. I am a YouTuber who focuses on how AI impacts human beings, and I'm also a PhD student at Harvard and MIT. I actually work on AI in medicine. Um, I work on non-invasive brain stimulation for like Alzheimer's and ML for non-invasive brain stimulation. So I'm, my, my language model expertise and whatnot is, um, I guess, somewhat rooted in like things that I've worked on academically, but I've always, I've, I, my undergrad was in biomedical engineering when I went to Cornell, my PhD is in medical engineering and medical physics. So yeah, my formal expertise is expertise has always been on the clinical side. How do you feel about social media integrating so much AI now? It's not new. I think that I talk about AI professionally. I do it. I recognize kind of under the hood that like AI has become this marketing term in a lot of ways that like has almost ceased to have any meaning. So I'm not surprised by it, but like recommendation systems have been around for, you know, what is it, 2014? They've been around at least since I was in high school, I graduated high school in 2014. So at least around then, because you could still get recommendations for like Facebook friends. So it's not a new thing to be in social media platforms. I think well, that- like the recommendation, uh, the, 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 the uh, hold on, the recommendation of like the new friends, that's, that's, that's powered by AI? It can be, it yeah. depends on the platform. So I'm thinking of like the explore page which has evolved over time on Instagram, where now the signals that it's using to recommend you things are more complicated and help you find content that is like kind of outside of that like first degree connection that is like you follow this person and you interact with their content um, initially i think it was a, a lot simpler in terms of like you know you follow this group of people you engage with this group of people they engage with this kind of content or we should recommend it to you whereas now it's like you know you 
clicked on an ad about something once or you like stayed on an Instagram ad for like more than a half second. And now it's like, these are all the ads that you get. Have fun. So, so it has evolved, but it, it was there maybe not fully to begin with, but it's, it's been there for a bit in terms of my thoughts on, I don't know, the use of AI on different platforms. It's not, I don't know that I have strong feelings on it, not because I don't think it's a problem, but because like, I think that the platforms and what they're doing are more of the problem than the tools that they use to do it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and and so, yeah, any system, whenever, whenever you're trying to optimize for engagement, um, A, that's just an inherently hard problem um, because as we saw with early uh, recommendation systems, the best way to do it is to evoke strong emotions. Uh, and the way that you do that is to maybe not actively, but a kind of passively dissuade nuance um, and and like nuanced conversation um, and connection in some ways, because connecting with like, you want to optimize for engagement that has people staying on the platform. <laughs> And so like if people make friends, that's great, but like then they leave the platform, which is not great. So I think that this is just a progression of a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I do find the various chatbot whatnots that platforms are doing these days to just be deeply annoying. But yeah. that's more of a personal preference, I think. Yeah. And, and, and I realized too, <clears throat> I think that uh chat GPT has done a great job in marketing almost a, a bad great job. Where they they like what they do specifically the 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 uh, uh predictive text or whatever the hell they call that I think that has mm -hmm. what's become more synonymous and then when people when people say AI thinking about like yeah. the uh, Chat GPT predictive text box that you can ask questions and create prompts you know what I'm saying like seeing that yeah. a lot of uh, platforms are initiating that so to your point like yeah it's just starting to be misused and mean everything and nothing at the same time sometimes. Yeah. And I mean, OpenAI, like, has always been very, very good at public comms and marketing, like, well before ChatGPT came out. And so I think that, I don't know, I don't use ChatGPT a lot, not because I don't use language models, but because of the language models that I've tried, I find that there are just other more useful ones. <laughs> yeah, I like uh, and so yeah, I, I like it. Too. Yeah, I, I always do find it really interesting that that they have cornered the market because I don't th think that they've cornered the market by making the best product. Um, I think that they just like shove it in everyone's faces so that, you know, you don't necessarily know that there are other options. And also, I think that the other options like Google has only recently started promoting Gemini and they're still not promoting it very strongly. It's very hard in certain instances to talk about AI to other people mm -hmm. because you're trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Like, yeah, I know. But then you're also trying to be like, but there's also these cool things, too. So I feel like sometimes yeah. it's like hard to mitigate, especially in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think I guess I, would say I find like one to one conversations can be good. I think that particularly on places like Twitter or sometimes YouTube. It can just be hard to have those conversations because it's it's I mean it's the eternal issue of having any sort of discourse on Twitter, which is like yeah. you're not <laughs> you're just fully talking past each other the entire time. But also like the narrative is not set on like what the actual facts of the situation are. It's set on like what people are saying about their thoughts on things. And so it's just like, well, like this isn't true, this isn't true. This is kind of true, but the way it's being framed is like very manipulative. And then Definitely. this other thing that like would actually be a lot more interesting is true, but we're just not talking about it. You're like, cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, I've I've come to the conclusion that even though I enjoy being on Twitter, it is not a place for nuance. And in certain instances, like unless you find you a good thread or you mm -hmm. find somebody that you find that's very credible and legitimate, you watch that shit. Other than that, though, it's like not a place for nuance and facts. No. <laughs> no. I am we 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 have a bit of a joke in my agency that's like the first rule of twitter is to like post and then leave <laughs> and then the second yeah. rule of twitter is to not open twitter <laughs> yeah. um, and i think that is definitely for twitter in particular i think that that's, that's the approach that i tend to take where I'm like i'm gonna hop on for five minutes i might like say a thing I'm going to disappear for a week because um, I don't actually want to see my mentions. Like, I'm good. They're not going to be fun. Yeah. I'm <laughs> curious, though. 
Cause let's say the one time you feel me, and I kind you kind of went in, but you know what I mean. You just like I would save it. I was uh talking about social experiment, the documentary, and you was yeah. like, ah, it's not, it's not, it's 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 not all that. You feel me? The social. Um, I know. I was gonna say the social network, and I was like, nope, that was a movie. You know what I'm saying? Dilemma. The social the, dilemma. The social dilemma. Yeah. No, that's not it. Social dilemma. Yeah, I, like the reason why I bring it up is because I know that a lot of people, when they start talking about to me, like media literacy, you feel me? Or they're thinking about how how the all the apps work and how they can be, you feel me, manipulative or use psychological, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Different ways to work, this, that, and the other. It, it's quoted a lot, especially within, you know what I'm saying? Just I feel like within a lot of conversations and, you know what I'm saying, in dialogue, I consider you somebody that's an expert, you feel me, of not only AI, but also I feel like tech in many different instances, you feel me? Uh, what what was your analysis of, of the film or what you feel comfortable in sharing anyway? I know the tech bros can be kind of, you know what I'm saying, obnoxious, you feel me? Yeah, I made a video on it oh, fairly soon it? after it came out. And I think my, I had a few takeaways at the time that have kind of evolved since then. At the time I watched it and I think when, when I watch things like this, I have to like watch it once and just like experience it as like me. And then I kind of have to like do the thing where it's like, you watch it again, like with your parents or like something like that, where it's like, yeah. I, I come from this, I come at this from like a fairly expert perspective as someone who knows a lot of the people who do, who have done this work. And like, this is not what this is meant for. It's meant for like my parents <laughs> who are not like as, um entrenched in this field as i am but i would say when i first watched it um i think i had two main points of frustration one was that it felt like um a confession for the white guys who kind of started this all in a lot of ways um i think tristan harris has done some some good work but in in the particular case of this documentary it was like a bunch of guys basically being like I had such a great time working at Google and like all these other tech companies. And like, I really liked the stuff that I was doing. And then like, I left and I did this other thing. And then, you know, later on, I was like, wait, I think this is bad. And it's like, okay, so like you made the thing, you got super rich on the thing. And, like fast forward, like five years, you like had kids probably. And then you were like, oh shit. And like, I, I, I am glad that you had the realization at some point, but when you were making the thing in the first place, there were people who were already sounding the alarm and they were mostly women of color. <laughs> so oh. that, that was, I think, a, a big sticking point for me with that documentary because it was just like, on one hand, you know, I don't think that it would have gotten the, the kind of mass audience that it did if it weren't for the people involved in it, if it weren't for the framing. And at the same time, like so many of my videos are about like nuance and how to, and I think that the perspective that it came at this from was I won't say it was like at the level of like interviewing Mark Zuckerberg about like ethics in tech but it was like in that oh. direction where I was just kind of yeah. like well like y'all get to to have kind of the white savior angle of like we created this and we feel bad now so we want to like do something about it but we're only going to talk about it in like very high level abstract terms. And the end of the movie was like in that very Silicon Valley way of like, I don't let my kids use social media. And it's like, okay, well, your kids aren't really like, that's 0.00001% of the problem here. And you're also like real rich. So like you could do more. Um, so I think that was, that was my kind of first complaint with the movie. My second complaint was I, I think I've talked on my channel before about anthropomorphizing technologies and the way that they demonstrated how these systems work, because there was that like back computer with like the two guys who were handling the recommendation system or whatever. It's been like a minute since I've watched it. I thought that in some ways, I think that that's probably a better representation of AI than I've seen in a lot of stuff. But it was also just very flashy in a way that I think assigns agency to these systems that they don't have and kind of uses that as a shield for like the people who built it. <laughs> um, because there is something to be said about like a lot of these systems are, are black boxes and it's true that we don't necessarily know how they work on the inside. Um, but in my opinion, like the, the, and I think this has come up in conversation in the past when people ask me, you know, am I 
do I see stuff like deep fakes as like more concerning compared to, you know, anything that happened beforehand? The answer is like kind of yes, but also like Photoshop was a thing before this and like Microsoft Paint or whatever was a thing before this. And so like this is an extension of a human thing that has been happening for decades, if not centuries. And I think that like most innovation over time, you know, the they are accelerating in, in their essentially fidelity, how well they work and how well they can replicate things and how effective they are when it comes to your goal. But like from a revenge porn perspective, I'm like, well, revenge porn predates AI. And yeah. it wasn't like A, people have been doing this with deepfakes for like a while now. But B, like when I look on platforms like Twitter, for example, you don't need AI to convince people that something is true. Like you don't need to make a deep fake. We're already, I think, I I often joke that it's like, we already exist in the multiverse. (laughs) Um, Because we're all working on like different planes of fact. (laughs) And so I don't need to throw a bunch of compute at a thing to like generate a video to post somewhere to be like, I don't know, the vaccines give you 5G or like whatever it is. I can just say that. Yeah, hey, yeah, people will be like, it's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I do you think, you think that... the documentary would have been better if it would have had if it would have accounted more for the early whistleblowers and how they are women of color and how you know what I'm saying they were impacted by whistleblowing and just really accounting more for like that intersectional history, or you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think true, so. And there were some women of color who who were included towards the end of the the documentary, and I appreciated seeing them there. Coded Bias is a documentary that I think it came out earlier that year. It's based on Joy Bolmini's work. She recently finished her PhD in the Media Lab at MIT. And her work focuses on facial recognition. So she early in her grad studies was analyzing these systems and basically found that when she tried to use them on her face, she's a fairly dark skinned woman. Um, they tended to fail and so her whole thesis ended up being like why does this happen in these systems how can we audit them in order to make sure this doesn't happen how can we she has a a consulting company now um how can we you know assist companies in in using these tools while being aware of these risks um and her and deb rashi have, have done a lot of very cool work on how do you audit these systems and then like is you know Public auditing, essentially public shaming in a sense, bringing things out to the public square, a good way of getting companies to improve their AI systems. And, and is uh, the person you was talking about, their their research kind of intersects with the a few different police. I think a few, it's like it's like a like a, a police department or two that had mistaken identities for like some black dudes using. You know what I'm saying, so I think two black men using AI. Is that is, so, is that similar to this? Yeah, so so the documentary touches on biases in AI facial recognition systems. And so I believe they do touch on the legal system. I think they focus more on just the lack of like legal structures for AI. And so how these things end up getting used without like uh, approval from the general public, but also like a general understanding of like uh, the fidelity behind them, which in fairness, not in a good way. In, in, yeah. in fairness, read pejorative. Um, forensic science and like scientific testimony in the legal system is like also often a lot of bullshit. So, you know, it, it, it certainly fits the trend um, of people using tools and testifying about things to which they have no expertise or just lying. So like, you know, consistency. But I, I don't believe it explicitly touches on the, I think at the time there were two or three cases of um, black men who were arrested because a facial recognition system falsely identified them as a perpetrator of a crime. That also might have been under the, God, what was that company called? Mm, I have to take it off the backlog. But there was a company a while back, I assume that they're still in business, but I actually don't know. Um, but they were selling facial recognition systems to um, law enforcement. And so hmm. the problem on a lot of levels was that A, they scraped images off of the internet broadly. So it was unclear whether or not they were violating copyright for a lot of companies. I think Meta actually ended up going after them for ripping photos from Meta. Um, 
but they also said that the system performed at 100% accuracy and everyone was like, okay, so that's fake. Mm -hmm. Cause that's definitely not how uh, that works yeah. at all. <laughs> and it's Clearview AI. Clearview AI. Yeah. And the, oh, they, are still, <laughs> they still have a shiny website. Um, how Clearview AI helped shape the war in Ukraine is a fascinating Fascinating. Like, wait, hold on. What? Let me yeah, look. exactly. <laughs> wait, what? Like, what y'all doing in like, Ukraine? The way that you, you phrase that is like, so shaping in a good way, shaping in a bad way. Um, Living with anyway. your facial recognition? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a uh, uh, um, uh, face, what? Oh, what's the company called again? Track down those who attacked the capital. Damn. It's Clearview AI. But yeah, they got in a lot of water, rightfully so, very early in the company for basically a ripping a bunch of, of image data that was likely copyrighted or at least owned by like when you upload stuff. To so Facebook, illegally Facebook using images to let law enforcement get identify people on the street. <laughs> but then they also said that it worked with like a hundred percent accuracy and also would not let anyone like test it. <laughs> so it was one of those things where it's like, they're going to, you know, different law enforcement agencies and they're like, this works a hundred percent of the time. And those law enforcement agencies are like, cool here's a check like and and this ends up getting integrated into into law enforcement which wasn't great there's a new company that's trying to do ai based like gun detection for concerts it's questionable well it sounds questionable much, already yeah how how much this actually works there was i believe a 404 media article that that got into it where people were like they say they can do it multiple other people who have you know dug into the system and used it have found that it's basically like the TSA <laughs> where it's like they'll flag a bunch of like benign stuff um but can they can it accurately do you know what it says it's going to do maybe unclear um and so of course Eric Adams is deploying it to the New York City subway because why not I feel like free the like the, the concept of the free market and the concept of capitalism sometimes they hold tension i think that for all the reasons why you've you know what i'm saying illustrated because it shows yeah. that sometimes the problem in the death is just a little bit more profitable than you feel me the solution in life <laughs> you feel me and yeah. it's just like i think i think that that is the uh the weird thing to kind of negotiate or think through i feel like when it comes to ai yeah i feel like I've, I've talked about um saying uh, uh uh on my channel you know um ai being able to do all the art and the poetry and we still doing all the hard shit, you feel me and mm -hmm. just thinking about like how how much is being invested uniquely to make it where ai is doing all these artistic things <laughs> and not being able to you feel me wash the dishes build the house you know what i'm saying goddamn clean up the environment you feel me something mm -hmm. like that you know what i mean like like like, like at best it's it's taking jobs from low skilled jobs which is a word this was you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. made for you know exploiting people i thought like there's something to be said about it you know what i'm saying yeah the art thing is is interesting to me on several levels some of them kind of legal and and some of them more cultural on the legal side which is faster i think it's interesting just to see how much like uh like the patent office the pto is pto the patent and trademark office it's just not equipped to like deal with like an evolving understanding of like ownership in that you look at these massive data sets that these models are trained on and like the data sets are just links. So it's like, well, it's not the art, therefore there is no copyright issue here. But then it's like, okay, but like then the model, like when you train the model, it uses all these links to like pull the art and then train the model. But then on the model side, they're like, well, the model also isn't the art. And it's like, okay, but like, letter of the law yes but like we all know what we mean <laughs> when when we're looking at usage here um i think that on the cultural side what's interesting to me is that there's a level on which i feel like the art side like visual art specifically um almost could not have been of interest at this level like outside of kind of the graphic design and like computational photography sector because it before this it, it wasn't it was still in in making, but it wasn't of of interest at the level. This is like a very rough hypothesis that I've not dug into. I think NFTs had to come first. I think we need to have NFTs, and then that's what led to this. Um, because I think that like the crypto bros and like that part of the internet oh, needed shit. to like get NFTs into like the public sphere so much, and like get like crypto art into the public sphere so much for like Gen AI art to then uh, matter. Uh, okay okay I see because before that 
Because like when you look at crypto, like NFTs and stuff like that, like in a sense, I think that that was the first time in a while that like on on the public sphere, art was valued. Like art was really, 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 really valued. And we get into like the volatility of like cryptocurrency and blah, blah, blah. But like people were spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on art that was ephemeral and that they only owned a link to where the link host could like disappear and they would never have access to that art again, but they would own the link, which was done. Um, but I, it, it does feel like given that we had AI art beforehand and it wasn't the same quality. Um, so there is that, that issue. Um, but it does feel like, you know, you had, you had AI art. No one really cared about it. Then you had NFTs. People really cared about it because there was a lot of money in it. And then, you know, crypto mostly died from the, the public perception standpoint. And a lot of those guys moved into the AI art space. And so uh, now we care about AI art because there's a profit motive. So, yeah, I, I this is like purely me just like thinking through. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Though. Brain connecting like sense, things, though. having not actually dug into it. <laughs> but I, I do have this hypothesis that like, I think that I think that if we hadn't had NFT, I think we'd still have like the legal issues around this and like the artist representation issues around this and like, you know, the SAG and like WGA strikes and whatnot around this. But I don't know. I think that actually I think that SAG SAG probably would have been the thing that propelled video into kind of the public sphere. And then that by proxy may have propelled images into the public sphere. But even with that, I think that for SAG, it, it comes a lot more down to likeness mm -hmm. and, and individual ownership on that level than it does to like more abstract art. And, and so, yeah, that's my, that's my working theory on why people care about this so much because so it's not necessary i remember the first uh -huh. time i remember just looking at the first time being like people didn't give a shit about art before this like some people did there were communities of people who did but for but yeah most particularly people from a valuation yeah. standpoint most people didn't give a shit about art and people in the art sector like people who are you know spending like millions of dollars on like paintings and shit they also don't give a shit about this so like what changed <laughs> what's yeah. the thing that made this valuable and when i looked at it i was like i think it's an <laughs> Which yeah. sucks. <laughs> yeah, because you know, like ninety, like over ninety percent of that market went to hell in the handbasket.